Hello, everybody. Welcome to our QI webinar for today. Uh, my name is Dr. Suri Sharda. I'm the EDI lead here at the college, and I'd like to open our afternoon today with a land acknowledgement. I know we're all joining from different parts of the province today and maybe different parts of the country, uh, but I'm going to talk about the land upon which AT College sits, which is the, um, the building of the CPSO. And most importantly, I'm going to speak about what it means to do a land acknowledgement and what we all need to be thinking about when we acknowledge the land. So the territory upon which AT College sits is the tr traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat people. The land is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. And while acknowledging the land is very welcome and very necessary, it really is only a small part of cultivating strong relationships with First Peoples of Canada. And importantly, acknowledging territory has to happen within a larger context of genuine and ongoing work to forge real understanding and to challenge legacies of colonialism. Those legacies are not just historic, they exist today, and we see them manifest in many ways not least differential healthcare outcomes, which is really important for us as physicians and healthcare providers. As the regulator of physicians with a mandate to protect the public of Ontario through right touch regulation, we are tasked with ensuring that physicians meet the standard of care. And I would argue that the accountability to those we serve needs to be to all those we serve, not just those whose voices are the loudest and whose privilege is the greatest. We have been embarking upon this work diligently at the CPSO, recognizing that it's a lifelong journey, and we will uh, give you a bit more information about that later. But I also want to say importantly around a land acknowledgement that it is also about being in solidarity with other groups. And today we're gonna to be hearing some very important information specifically about anti-black racism. So I will hand over to my colleague, Dr. Everson, to uh, lead us into the webinar. Great, thank you, Saru. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for signing in and attending our March 2023 Quality Improvement Webinar. I'll provide uh, some background on our QI program webinars series and just some housekeeping items related to format today, and then we'll get into the presentation. So this webinar, this is our March 2023 Quality Program Webinar, and this is part of a recurring webinar series that's to update and inform physicians of the variety of quality program options that are available at the CPSO for physicians to meet their college quality requirements. As mentioned, my name is Ted Everson. I'm a medical advisor at the college. I work primarily in our quality programs, and I'll be co-hosting with uh, my colleague, Dr. Sharda, who had just provided the land acknowledgement. I want to provide some background information and a brief uh, bio on Dr. Sharda as well as our guest presenters. So Dr. Sharda is the inaugural Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Lead at the CPSO, where she has been leading cross-organizational work to embed an EDI, an anti-racist lens, into the complaints process, policy work, as well as ongoing education of our various committees and college council. In addition, Dr. Sharda is the Associate Dean of Equity and Inclusion in the Faculty of Health Sciences at McMaster University. The focus of our webinar today is to review and better understand how physicians can embed and integrate EDI principles into quality improvement projects and initiatives, whether that's within an individual or group practice or within the hospital setting. We're very fortunate to have two guest presenters today in Dr. Jennifer Bryan and Serena Thompson. Dr. Bryan is the founding chair of the Canadian Association of Emergency Physicians Anti-Racism and Anti-Colonialism Committee. Her work is focused on equity in emergency medicine and is at the intersection of global health with anti-racism and anti-colonialism. She's an emergency physician and director of research in emergency medicine at the University Health Network and an assistant professor at the University of Toronto. She's the director of operations of the Toronto Addis Ababa Academic Collaboration in Emergency Medicine, known as TAC-EM, and a founding member 
of the University Health Network Emergency Department Sickle Cell Working Group. In addition, we have Serena Thompson, who is here in her role and experience as a patient advocate. Serena lives with sickle cell disease, and after experiencing years of humiliation, misunderstanding, isolation in schools, hospitals, and places of employment, Serena became engaged in the sickle cell community as an advocate for joining by joining committees and organizations champion, championing for patient-centered care. Serena's main focus is advocacy and spreading awareness through information sessions such as conferences, symposiums, seminars, and panel discussions by collaborating with educational institutions, hospitals, community organizations, and media such as radio and television. Alongside Serena's patient advocacy in the community, she recently served as the interim president of Sickle Cell Association of Ontario, a member of the Minister's Patient and Family Advisory Council, the Healthy Debate Committee, and the Medical Doctors Admissions, to, to name a few. Serena is now serving on Healthcare Excellence Canada, uh, the UHN ED Sickle Cell Working Group, and is co-chair of Ontario Health's Sickle Cell Disease Quality Standard Advisory Committee. In terms of the format for our webinar today, um, I'm going to hand it over soon to Saru and uh, to our guest presenters who will be going through a slide presentation. We estimate around 30 minutes. We will leave time for Q&A at the end. Please try to save your questions until the end, or you can consider inserting them into the chat and we will track them. This webinar will be recorded and saved to our CPSO website and as well to our YouTube channel, where you will find prior quality program uh, recordings. And with that, let's move on to our March 2023 webinar, and I'll pass it over to my colleague, Dr. Sharda. Thank you. I don't want to take too much time because after hearing those bios, and I've actually had the pleasure of sharing space with Dr. Brian before, not yet the pleasure with Serena, but I think that we really want to hear from them. Really all I'm going to say is that we are trying to focus some of our EDI work this year at the CPSO on quality improvement and really providing you with tools as physicians and examples such as the one you're gonna hear about today in how you can embed this work into your own quality improvement efforts. We have been doing cross organizational work with a real focus in EDI for about two and a half to three years now. We would love for you to learn about that work, especially how it affects you as physicians. And my colleague Jacqueline is now putting in our 2021 and 2022 EDI reports, which you can look at in your own time. Our latest effort in this area in terms of our policy work is in our draft health and human rights policy, where we will and have uh, embedded concepts like cultural safety, cultural humility, anti-racism and anti-oppression. So I urge you to look at those documents to expand your own awareness and education in this space. Thank you for making time today on a wintry, blustery afternoon to join us. And I'm going to hand over now to Dr. Jennifer Bryan and to Serena um, and let you hear their expertise. Thank you so much, Dr. Sharda and Dr. Everson. Um, it's wonderful to be here to speak with you today. Um, we're going to be talking about centering equity, diversity and inclusion in quality improvement. And the way that we're going to be talking about this is the best way that we know how um, in giving you the example um, of the work that we've been doing together, collaborating to improve the care of people living with sickle cell disease. I want to acknowledge that we've been supported by funding through the University Health Network, both through the Physician Council on Quality and Safety and the Summer Training and Research in Emergency Medicine or STAR EM program. Both Serena and I have received speaking honoraria from nonprofit and academic institutions. Serena also has received an honorarium from Healthcare Excellence Canada, and I've received in kind support as an EDI advisor for the Canadian Association of Emergency Physicians. 
I want you to think of this theme throughout our session today. We can't have quality without equity. And this is paraphrasing um, the international, um, uh, or sorry, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. And what this phrase says to me is that equity, diversity, and inclusion is not a niche topic. It's not a topic that's separate from the rest of the work that we're doing. Instead, that EDI needs to be incorporated throughout all of our initiatives in order for our initiatives to succeed. Our objectives for today are to um, uh, talk about recognizing opportunities for applying QI principles in advancing equity, diversity, and inclusion, and to describe the benefits of purposeful community collaboration in QI work. And towards the end, we're going to talk about five questions that came up through our own work um, that continue to inspire this initiative um, and others that we're engaged in, and hopefully um, uh, will offer food for thought for your own work. Now, a little background on sickle cell to begin with. Um, so sickle cell disease is a recessive um, hereditary hemoglobinopathy. It's characterized by vasoocclusive episodes that cause complications as varied as MIs, PEs, um, and functional asplenia. It also causes um, a severe painful episodes known as vasoocclusive episodes. And these are what we're going to be focusing um, most on um, in the initiative that we'll be describing today. Now, in Canada, somewhere around 6,000 people live with sickle cell disease. Most of those are in Ontario, and most of those are Black. But we know that race is a social construct, not a biological one. And so when we see differences in health due to race, we always need to look further. And in the case of sickle cell, that difference is due to heredity. Um, so if you have an ancestor that comes from an area endemic um, for malaria, you are more likely to inherit the alleles that lead to sickle cell disease. Now, these are all things that we can read out of textbooks about sickle cell, but that, that do not truly really give us an appreciation of what sickle cell disease is. Um, and Serena, um, I'd like for you to speak with us a little bit about your experience living day to day with sickle cell disease. Thank you, Dr. Brian. <laughs> um, and uh, thank you, CPSO, for inviting me. Um, I want to uh, start by saying, yes, I um, I live with sickle cell disease every day, and um, I wanted to go through actually just chronically like how it's affected me um, uh, through my life. So as a child. Um, once I migrated here to Canada as a child, uh, I guess my parents had to take me to sick kids. So that was by, that was my second home as a child, um, basically because I did get sick often. Um, I missed a lot of school. Um, it, yeah, so it was frequent hospitalizations, but it was like, it was also complications that came along with it every, each and every time. Um, so it led me to be like quiet, shy, reserved, um, naturally, you know, introverted when I was younger, but I'm, I still wouldn't, um, I guess growing up, I didn't understand the impact of sickle cell until I was a teenager. So then once I, um, started going to, to, uh, high school, I was hiding the fact that I had sickle cell disease. Um, what would give it away is that I, I was very jaundiced. Um, and so a lot of my friends or colleagues would ask, you know, how come your eyes are green? They would think it's green because I was wearing glasses. So they'd be like, how come your eyes are green? And I'm like, it's yellow, it's called jaundice. I would have to explain everything to them. And then that's when they'd be like, oh, oh, sickle cell disease, is it contagious? And, you know, that was something 
a lot of people didn't understand back then. Um, I they, The first thing they thought was it was contagious. So I would see their their body reaction, their facial reaction, everything. And I would have to explain to them, no, it's not. And, and let them know uh, exactly what the disease is. Um, as, a, as a young adult, things got a little bit harder as well because I was going to college. And I tried my best to stay in college but each time, each semester, towards the end of the semester, it was stressful. And that's what um, would always cause my uh, crisis to flare up. And so then I would be out of school for how long and not be able to finish my semester. I would have to go back, try to advocate. Um, nobody understood you know, what, how sickle cell affects me as to why I can't get my work done, as to why I cannot you know, attend and so forth. So. I had to have a advocate. I had an advocate at that time to try to let them understand that, you know, no matter what, I'm still coming to school. I just need the tools to, uh, um, to help me, uh, you know, just continue through school and to finish. So, um, but I wasn't able, the advocacy did not go far. Um, so it was mainly, you know what, um, you failed your course, you have to come back and try it again kind of thing. And so that kind of got frustrating. And so, um, once I turn, uh, once I'm, uh, adult, I'm working, um, I'm a single mom, um, all these, uh, you know, just life happening and um, working and going to college and, and as a single mom, I still felt alone because nobody still understood. Like, it's not even the understanding, it's me not being able to sit down with somebody and let them know this is the issue, this is what's going on. How can we, like, how can you help? Or is there any tools that I can utilize to help me continue working continue going to school and so forth. Um, you lose a lot of friends, especially when you, they feel, when you feel, especially when they feel overwhelmed um, with your situation. Um, once you get older, you start thinking more about death because at one point I was given a death sentence. You know, as I don't remember how young I was, but I remember my death sentence was for 20, 21 and so forth. But just to give you a side note, I'll be turning 50 on Sunday. So I don't know who told me I would last till 20 or 21, but um, I, I'll be turning 50. So, uh, you know, there is, there is treatment out there. There are doctors out there that look after you. You do have to understand that, um, you know, there's pain management. You have to deal with pain management. You have to um, also, uh, you know, deal with prevention as well. So always go to your, always go to your appointments. Always, you know, um, take your medication and so forth. So, um, but as an adult, it's a lot of stuff that goes on. Like there's fear of going back, to, going to the ER, um, because of the fear of the providers not understanding sickle cell to the point where um, they should be listening to the patient as well because you know they're living with it they're living with the disease so they know most about it um, there's you know room for collaboration there's room for patient uh, partnering um, and then there's disability you know, that doesn't recognize sickle cell as a, a disability. Um, financially, you know, a lot of people, a lot of us are um, in a financial rut because of the fact that we cannot work 20, you know, uh, regular hours. Um, a lot of us can't and um, part-time doesn't really cut it <laughs> sometimes. And then there's depression, um, um, you know, the mental health, piece to it where um, it affects us mentally because we could be we could be functioning just fine and then all of a sudden we get sick 
and everything is upside down. And so mentally um, we have to try to, you know, figure everything out and get things back right side up once we get out of the hospital. And, um, and then, yeah, and then I think it's very important to have a family doctor, hematologist and specialist to uh, watch everything that's going on with you. And, um, and, and then this is what led me to advocacy. So uh, I guess that's where you see my picture on the screen. <laughs> Um, and yeah, so I met with uh, Seema and she wanted to know about basically about, you know, my relationship with the emergency room. And that's where I said there was no relationship. And this is how me and Dr. Brian met. So <laughs> there you go. Which brings us to today. Serena, I did not realize that you were having the big 5-0 birthday coming up. So happy early birthday. That's wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Um, and so I think Serena, you, you might've laughed when you saw this picture. Cause you know, I have, I have two favorite pictures. Um, this is one, the second one is coming up a little bit later on. Um, so uh, Serena, thank you so much for that. I think it's so important for us in healthcare to realize that, um, the things our patients are dealing with are so much more than the, the pathophysiology that we read about in the textbooks. Um, sickle cell disease is so much more than a red blood cell disorder. Order. Um, and we really need to hear from people who are living with this in order to, to better understand. Um, one thing that Serena did not um, talk about, um, but that I've certainly heard um, from many patients, is that not only um, are they dealing with um, what are often invisible complications of sickle cell disease when they're seeking care, they're dealing with the structural and interpersonal um, anti-Black racism that exists in our healthcare system. And I'd like to speak about that a little bit now. Um, 2020 was a real awakening um, for many, um, including within the healthcare system, to the fact that Canada is not immune to racism. Now, while Canada has an over 300 year legacy of, um, of incredible black leadership and, um, and anti-racism advocacy, um, we still um, uh, suffer from um, big um, discrepancies in terms of health processes and outcomes um, in our country. In 2017, the UN published a report um, that highlighted um, that if you were Black in Canada, um, you are more likely to face barriers to education and employment, um, that you were more likely to be um, represented in the criminal justice system and the child welfare systems. Um, we know that if you are Black in Canada, um, that you are less likely to be considered for an organ transplant. You are less likely to receive much needed breast cancer screening and cervical cancer screening. Um, within Toronto, we know that if you are Black, you are 20 times more likely to be shot and killed by police than if you are white. So we know that Canada is not immune to racism. And so when we see racial differences in health, again, we remember that race is a social construct, not a biological one. And racial health inequalities are pervasive because racism is pervasive. And that's a difficult pill for us to swallow as healthcare providers. My colleague and mentor, Dr. Dominic Shelton, puts it this way, being altruistic and having biases aren't mutually exclusive. We all have biases. The question is whether we bring them into our interactions with others. And this understanding um, really um, uh, brought about a, um, an interest and support um, uh, for a practical strategy um, uh, to address barriers um, uh, due to the social determinants of health within our emergency department at the University Health Network. And along with that came an opportunity for us to talk about anti-Black racism within our department and ways in which 
we might address that. Now, we are the emergency department um, associated with the largest red blood cell disorders clinic in North America. We see um, uh, more than 200 people um, uh, per year um, coming into the emergency department with complications related to sickle cell disease. And so this seemed like a very um, obvious place for us to start. We were hearing from patients that there were barriers to coming into the emergency department, just like Serena mentioned. Um, feeling that the relationship with the emergency department really was non-existent. And we looked at some of the factors that were um, potentially contributing to that. So certainly um, uh, we looked at, um, at how um, we were addressing um, anti-Black racism um, within our department um, and our hospital. Um, we looked at our own understanding um, of the complications of sickle cell. And we looked at our understanding of the role of opioids in sickle cell care. And we recognized that this was a, a barrier for us, um, that patients were saying, just like Serena mentioned, um, that they did not feel understood when they came to the department, um, that they did not feel that we were believing um, that they were having pain or giving them pain um, management um, uh, quickly in the way that was needed. Um, there is an interesting study that was done in the States, actually a pair of studies, looking at perceptions of emergency department providers of opioid use disorder in people living with sickle cell. And on the left, you can see the results from Shapiro et al., um, where um, emergency providers um, thought that up to 20% of patients seen in the emergency department with sickle cell um, were experiencing opioid use disorder or were drug seeking, right? In reality, that number is less than 2%, so less than the general population when prescribed opioid medications. And so while there certainly is an opioid epidemic that is complicating the care for people living with sickle cell disorder, um, it, it's not sickle cell disease that is driving the opioid epidemic. Um, and so that's something that we really wanted to focus on um, in our collaboration. Uh, like Serena said, um, I reached out to her. Um, we had overlapped um, briefly um, in organizing a national sickle cell conference some years back. Um, and I said to her, what, what would you think about joining a collaboration with the emergency department? We also brought in community organizations, the Sickle Cell Awareness Group of Ontario, the Sickle Cell Association of Ontario. We brought in emergency physicians and nurses, our patient relations, um, social work. We got support um, from our department leads. And we focused on three priorities, advancing excellence in care for people living with sickle cell, addressing racism within our department, and centering collaboration, a real nothing about us without us strategy inspired by anti-ableism advocacy. We had a crash course in quality improvement methodology with support from quality improvement leaders in our department um, and at the greater hospital level at UHN. And we adopted the model of improvement. We focused our intervention on reducing time to analgesia. Anecdotally, we were hearing from patients that it was just taking too long to get good pain medication in the emergency department when they were coming in with vasoocclusive episodes. The baseline data that we collected, um, it confirmed what our patients were telling us, right? Um, uh, there is a handbook um, of, a click of, of a clinical handbook for managing vasoocclusive episodes in sickle cell um, for Ontario that was published in 2017. Part of the recommendation in that handbook is that patients should wait no longer than 30 minutes after triage to receive appropriate opioid analgesia. 
So we looked to see how many, um, how many visits are we are we meeting that target, and it was very few. So vanishingly um, few, 5.6% um, of visits um, for um, patients receiving opioids in 30 minutes or less. We did a root cause analysis um, as part of our collaboration. Um, so looking to our physicians and nurses, our patient collaborators, our community advocates, and saying what are what are the where are the places um, where things are falling down, um, where are the pain points. Um, and we found, um, not surprisingly, um, that uh, you know there are overall issues in the emergency department with overworked and limited staff um, affecting all patients um, coming in. Um, specific to patients living with sickle cell, um, there were concerns about difficulty obtaining IV access. Um, there were some gaps in terms of how patients were being triaged and what the appropriate triage level was for patients living with sickle cell. And the recommendation is a CTAS of two. And there were important facilitators of care. So we saw that um, when the order sets or protocols that we have um, available in the department were used, patients were more likely to get their pain medication sooner. We also saw that when, um, when nurses administered opioids prior to formal um, assessment by physicians, patients were more likely to receive their opioids. And we decided as a group really to focus on those two facilitators and play to our strengths and say, these are things that are working well. How can we do them even better? We realized that at the beginning, um, there is a lot of, of rebuilding of trust that needed to happen. Um, like Serena had said, um, and which was the focus of um, her profile in the Canadian Medical Association Journal, the relationship um, for so many patients with sickle cell um, and the emergency department is non-existent. So we started to work together um, to build that relationship. And it started with the very first um, community forum um, on sickle cell held by our department in collaboration with the Sickle Cell Awareness Group of Ontario. And we titled this Building Community um, because this was really the focus. It was an opportunity for, um, for patients to tell us in the department, what were the what are we missing? What are we doing wrong? What do we need to do better? And we brought in, again, our nurses, our patient partners, community advocates, physicians, um, our hematology colleagues um, to really say, okay, we, we want to listen, we want to do this better. Um, and in um, uh, in using the feedback that we got from this forum um, and from our root cause analysis, um, we rebuilt our order set. And we had direct input um, from patients to say, what are the things that are most important? Front and center, very first line you can see here is start appropriate pain management within 30 minutes of ED arrival. That target had not been included in our protocols previously. Um, and it was very meaningful um, to our collaboration to see that as the very first, um, uh, the very first phrase. Um, our um, patient collaborators um, um, advised us throughout the redevelopment of the order set, um, including, as you can see here, um, a statement around how important it is to allow patients to use their own coping strategies when dealing with pain um, and recognizing that, um, that people living with sickle cell have a lifetime's worth of experience in how to address their own pain. Um, that we need to, to support them in. Um, most importantly, in our collaboration, were a series of education sessions, and these were patient-led education sessions. You can see Serena on the portable computer here um, with our nurse champion, um, Ms. Ruth Apia Boateng. Um, Serena, can you talk with us a little bit about what you did in these education sessions? Yes, so it was um, it was great doing these education sessions, especially during lockdown. <laughs> um, 
you know, we, we still were able to, uh, you know, educate and inform, um, you know, the ED, the, everybody that was in the ED. And so my um, role really was to just let them know uh, what we go through when we decide to finally come to an e to the ED. And so I, um, what I would be uh, letting them know that first and foremost, the pain is real, no matter what, because of the fact that um, usually we, we are, we actually try to stay away from the hospital. So when we're trying to, uh, you know, um, take everything, like do pain management. So we're trying to take our meds, um, you know, a hot shower or warm bath or, or, or a heating pad, um, you know, take a nap. All these things that we try to do uh, doesn't work. So by the time we are hit, hitting the ED, we're in excruciating pain and, and we're really looking for help. So when we say our pain, our pain is 10 out of 10, I think that's more because we waited so long uh, in order to really get help. Um, but our hesitancy is there because of the fact that we're not sure what kind of treatment we're going to get at that time when we show up, right? We're hoping, we just, we just want relief. And if we get there and, uh, you know, lots of questions are thrown at us and all this stuff it's delaying the actual treatment at the time we can ask questions after no problem after you know we've calmed down and uh, uh things have settled and and i have all my scruples at that time <laughs> uh you know so um you know the pain i just wanted to make sure for we we made sure to let them know that the the pain will not be on our face most of the time you know if anything we're at the edge of crying but the pain won't show and and then most of the time we're trying to distract ourselves during that time before we get any kind of pain medication um so yes it was listed that we distract ourselves with our you know our phones our computers um music um the tv uh talking with somebody our advocate that's there and so on so that is just to take our mind off of the excruciating pain um i also let them know that pregnant Pregnancy crisis, pregnancy pain and crisis are completely different. Crisis is even worse than pregnancy pain. I have a 24 year old, so um, I went through it and it, it was absolutely different. I mean, pregnancy pain, it was bad, but it's temporary. Um, sickle cell pain, um, it gets worse with intensity. Um, and then we try to let them know that, you know, most of the time we don't want to be there. So it's not like we're giving an attitude. It's just that we are, we're, we're just, our, we're just throwing our hands up in the air because we just need some sort of help. Um, and then, you know, I talk, I talk about the biases and so forth, um, you know, when we dress a certain way, coming into the ER, don't judge us on that. Because most of the time for me, I would be coming in my pajamas or sweats because I, my pain was overnight in the middle of the night. So I don't have time to dress up at the, before I used to dress up and, and do my hair and put myself together while in crisis, you know, just to be noticed and, and, and taken serious once I reached the ED. So I talked about that. I let them know that it's it's um, it's good to just offer like water because most of the time we're we're very thirsty once we're on the med um, once we're getting the IV uh, medication. Warm blankets is a big thing, and um, and then an advocate if we had an advocate with us or if somebody can advocate for us that's there. And then a courtesy call to the hematologist would be great as well to let them know that their patient is in crisis um, because collaborations always work best. And um, also anxiety and stress is 
uh, comes along with the crisis. So if you're able to help reduce the anxiety and stress um, by not uh, by reducing the trauma as well, not you know um, not thinking we're a drug seeker or we're being belligerent or stuff like that. It's it's just at the time, most of the time, we can't even verbalize how much the pain is. And so then that is why we need people to understand that we're already being traumatized by the pain. Um, on top of that, we have anxiety because the anxiety brings on the pain even more for me um, because I don't know if I'm going to get better. Is this going to happen? Like, am I going to get better today or is something else going to happen? And so that was the type of things that I was uh, letting everybody know. And, um, and the main thing is just do not be scared to treat a sickle cell patient. We're, we're not scary. <laughs> maybe, maybe our um, situation could be complicated and, and um, challenging, but do not be scared to treat us. And that's it. Thank you, Serena. Um, so, for everybody listening, I, I think that's a that's a mini version um, of the education session. So, this is what our nurses were hearing. This is what our physicians were hearing. Um, so many misunderstandings um, that we all had um, about sickle cell disease and about pain, right? About what it looks like when someone's in pain. It doesn't have to look like someone writhing around on the ground and screaming. Right. It can look just like Serena was describing, um, like someone who's trying to use their own coping strategies. Right. So someone who's having something to eat, someone who's talking on the phone. Those aren't um, uh, those aren't signs that someone's feeling better. It could be signs that someone's actually feeling worse and doing what they can to take care of themselves. Right. Um, and Serena, I think that's such an important statement that you made at the end, um, uh, just to not be scared um, uh, to treat patients with sickle cell, um, uh, that this can be an intimidating thing, but that we need to work together um, to make sure that people are getting the care they need. Um, I want to show you some of the um, the early data. Um, it's um, from our, our first PDSA cycle. Um, it has not yet been peer reviewed. Um, it is encouraging to us, um, but we are still in the process of analyzing this data. Um, so we knew that um, before we started our initiative, um, only 5.6% um, of, or in only 5.6% of visits related to sickle cell were patients getting um, opioid analgesia within that 30 minute target. Following the first cycle, um, we've tripled that number, so up to 15.6%. Um, um, we're not at that 100% that we're aiming for, but we're heading in the right direction. Um, we did a comparison um, with another patient population um, that experiences severe pain in coming to the emergency department, um, and that's patients experiencing renal colic. And you can see our run chart here with the renal colic in blue, sickle cell in red. Um, each point um, represents a month from January 19th to January 2020, um, with the time to opioids in minutes on the y-axis. And the time to opioid analgesia between um, patients with sickle cell and patients with renal colic was actually very similar before the, the intervention. Um, now, after our first cycle, um, we saw um, a shift. So there was a shift of 10 points um, for patients um, with sickle cell um, below the overall median. We did not see that shift with renal colic. Um, we did also note a trend um, at coming back up towards that median um, for patients with sickle cell after that initial burst of patient-led education sessions um, were ended um, and we had taken a step back to regroup and analyze our data. Um, but those gains seemed to be maintained for nine months. Now, this is a, a sometimes um, uh, maybe overused um, a proverb, but it's one that really speaks to the work um, that we do. And that's if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. 
So much of the work um, that Serena and I and the rest of the working group um, has done has been in relationship building, making it possible um, for us to continue um, in quality improvement um, for patients living with sickle cell in our department. Through this work, um, there were five questions um, that now serve to um, inform um, our ongoing initiatives as well as other initiatives um, in our department. Um, so the question of who should be at the table um, I can't think really of very many, if any, healthcare initiatives um, where a patient voice would not be beneficial. Um, the second question is, how are you valuing your collaborators' time? Um, the funding um, sources that I mentioned, um, a nice chunk of those went towards recognizing our patient collaborators um, in the form of honoraria. We wanted to be sure that we were valuing their time. Um, we think about how are the social determinants of health incorporated um, in quality improvement initiatives? What are the data that you're missing? In particular, in Canada, we lack um, data on sickle cell, especially with um, respect to the emergency department. Um, and um, in general, we lack a lot of uh, racial data um, to know how the impacts of anti-Black racism affect our patients. Um, and I'd encourage each of you to think about what are the health equity impacts of your own initiative. So you are working your own practice um, in your own department. When you're um, thinking of making a change, how might that change um, impact um, of folks that are from marginalized and vulnerable communities? Um, how are the folks that are most in need of your services going to be impacted um, by, um, by your own um, attempts at improving quality of care? I'd like to thank our working group members, um, along with the Sickle Cell Awareness Group of Ontario, the Sickle Cell Association of Ontario, and again, um, the University Health Network um, for funding this work. Thank you again to the, um, uh, the CPSO um, and to, um, and to Saru and to Ted um, for inviting us to speak with you today. And we look forward to addressing any of your questions. Great. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Jennifer. And thank you, Serena. That was uh, fantastic. We're really appreciative of it. Very impactful. Um, so yeah, let's open it up to questions. I don't believe that there's been anything in the chat. Um, so let's let's open it up. And um, if anyone has any questions, uh, please go ahead. And maybe I'll jump in with a question, Ted, while other folks are gathering their thoughts. Um, so Jennifer and Serena, um, there were so many important things that I think I took away as a physician as well from this presentation. So I have maybe one question for Jen and one for Serena. In terms of, you know, race as a social construct, Jennifer, that's something I talk about a lot in the teaching and, and advocacy and education I do in my roles. It can be a difficult concept, I think, for physicians to sort of wrap their head around. And I wondered how you managed, you know, with this project to really um, make that tangible for people so that they could really start to understand what that looks like. And I think we heard some of that from Serena that was really powerful, but I'm just interested from a physician perspective, how you got that message across. And then Serena, I think I just wanted to thank you for many things, but specifically what you said around how pain manifests and looks because, you know, as an anesthesiologist, I'm often actually called in to help when, you know, there might be somebody in crisis um, and deal with other kinds of acute pain issues. And there is, I think, a prevailing sort of assumption and education in medicine, particularly, you know, in the time that I trained, that if somebody isn't writhing around in pain and they're looking at their phone and they're, you know, that they're not in pain. Um, and I do think that that is also gendered and racialized, um, you know, that it gets kind of amplified for folks from black communities, folks from indigenous communities, you know, that idea that, you know, these 
folks are drug seeking. So I wanted to really thank you for pointing that out and making it part of the education because I think it's really important. Um, but yeah, I don't know if you have any thoughts on my question, Dr. Brian. Thank you for that, Saru. Um, so yes, so there are so many challenges um, with addressing racism in healthcare. Um, one of the um, the the exciting things um, about 2020 um, was that because there were so many more discussions um, about what race and racism means in Canada, um, there were new opportunities um, to have discussions about what did this mean in healthcare, what did this mean in our hospital, what did this mean in our department, um, discussions that. Um, those of us who are racialized um, have been um, have been working towards um, for a long time, um, but had, had had kind of seen a lot of those concerns fall on on deaf ears. Um, and uh, for the uh, one of the first times in my career, um, suddenly the doors opened wide. Um, people wanted to hear um, about um, anti-racism initiatives, about what it meant um, practically to take an anti-racist stance. Um, and um, and it was a uh, it was such an opportunity um, to say, okay, well, how do we um, how do we bring this into our day to day into the emergency department? Um, we have um, through the University Health at Mar Network a um, an excellent um, uh, support um, uh, built through the anti-racism and anti-black racism committee um, that is doing fantastic work on education, on supporting um, our healthcare providers um, in, um, in really coming to terms um, with what racism means um, in our healthcare system. System and in our day-to-day -day practice, um, and trying to, to get beyond the, um, I can't be racist because I'm a good person, right? I can't be racist because my whole life is about caring for people. Um, getting beyond that to say um, racism exists um, in our system, both at the structural level and at the interpersonal level, how do we get beyond that? Um, and for us, um, such a essential part of getting beyond that um, was in this community building, um, was in um, in a realizing that, um, uh, you know, while sickle cell um, impacts people of all races, um, in our province, most of those who are affected are Black. Um, and so people are dealing with not only a, a chronic, painful, um, life-limiting, potentially, um, uh, disease, um, uh, they're dealing with anti-Black racism um, and facing up against that when they come to the emergency department. Um, this was really brought home to me in a conversation I had um, with the patient I was caring for in the emergency department. Um, and instead of simply asking about, you know, what is your pain level right now and, you know, and, and what do you need from a, a physician approach, um, speaking with him as a person and saying, what is it like for you when you come in here? Right. Um, hearing such an echo of what Serena has said um, about that feeling of, of needing to, to dress up and present yourself in a certain way. Um, this patient I was speaking with um, was a young black man. Um, and he talked about as a young black man, he would not come to the emergency department dressed um, like he was at home. He said, I would not wear the hoodie and jeans that I had when my pain got overwhelming. Um, I changed, I dressed up. I knew that I needed to present myself in a different way um, in order to be taken seriously. Um, and so our healthcare system really cannot deny the impact of anti-Black racism on our patients. Um, and we have such an obligation to work together um, to address those important barriers to care. Yeah, so well said, uh, Dr. Brian. And I think um, really thinking about this is an opportunity, right? Like this is an opportunity for us to do better. We can, let's not think about whether we're biased or not, or whether anti-Black racism and other types of discrimination exist in our healthcare system. We have lots of data to show us that that happens and that is true. How do we now move forward through things like the QI collaborative initiative that you 
that you did. Um, I want to just see if there's any other questions coming up. Um, uh, maybe Ted, April. I, I don't see anything else, but I just maybe had, I know we're, we're running out of time, but uh, Dr. Brian, just uh, in terms of connecting this further with our quality improvement program and uh, one of our options called the partnership program, which is a, a hospital based option. Um, you know, you've outlined your experience with your sickle cell work at UHN. Um, so as we work with organizations in the partnership program and they're looking to develop uh, quality improvement part, uh, programs, uh, part, uh, initiatives, projects, um, what are a couple just kind of key takeaways for them to, you know, not only like embed EDI awareness and principles within their QI, like what are the next steps based on your experience? I know you've touched on a couple of things. One thing really interesting was the patient voice as part of that collaboration. But what what is that like? What does that on ramp look like for an organization that wants to pursue? EDI within their QI work? Um, so first off, absolutely essential, right? I, you know, that um, that theme of there's no quality um, without equity um, is, is absolutely true um, and should be reflected in all of our work. Um, so I very much encourage um, organizations um, to look to their communities um, for expertise, Right, um, you know the the expertise that we needed um, in sickle cell um, it came from Serena, it came from Marie, it came from Blanray, it came from our patient partners, our community advocates, um, and I think that any organization um, uh, looking to partner with community, um, with communities, um, it needs to have a very clear sense about how they're going to value um, uh, that, um, that input. Um, so, you know, it's not about checking off a box and saying, yep, you know, we had a patient on this team, check, check. Um, it's about um, really reflecting um, on how you're going to um, to value those voices. Um, so not only in terms of, of compensating time, which is incredibly important, um, but in valuing those voices in your processes, right? Um, so our initiative um, really was patient-led. Right. Um, the things that we thought um, would be useful um, for us to use as markers of success um, in our initiative were were wrong. They were completely wrong. And we would have had no idea um, if we hadn't heard from the patient partners. Um, Serena, you've heard me give this example before because it was such a light bulb moment um, for me when you said this. One of the, the early indicators um, that we thought of for improving care um, was in terms of patient complaints. Um, we thought, well, you know, if we are getting um, any patient complaints about care for sickle cell, if we decrease the number of complaints, then surely we're heading in the right direction, right? Um, Serena, do you remember what you told me when I said that? Not exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I certainly do. I certainly do. Okay. Yeah. So what Serena said to me and um, what had such impact was you said um, that no, if um, you know patient complains, that's a marker of, of people having faith that there's some hope in the system. Um, so if you're getting more complaints, that could actually be a really good thing. That could mean that, that people have um, some kind of hope for change and that you're actually listening. Um, and that really, it flipped our, our whole um, initiative on its head and really gave us something to think about. Um, so for organizations looking to partner with community, um, uh, Think about how you're going to do it in a meaningful way. How are you going to listen to those voices um, to actually inform your work? Get beyond um, the tokenism um, that can be the default in this work, um, and um, and think about the the value um, that those partners bring um, and how to recognize that not just in the work and the output, um, but also in terms of of compensating time. Um, it's so important. Great. Thank um, you. 
Yes, Saru, I think there's yeah. a couple of questions, right? We we'll try to get to. I know we're at time, but we'll yeah. try to squeeze them in, I think. So who was first, Saru? Who was I think uh, Lisa Isaac and then Kelsey. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I, that was a really inspiring talk, and I, I appreciate your um, your discussion of both of the process and the impact of of illness on on life. And um, so I I am a pediatric anesthesiologist. So I um, and I work in chronic pain, and so I have a a, a sense of social determinants of health and how they impact illness, but I was also really struck by by Serena, your comments about how illness can affect the your the social determinants of health. Uh, because in particular in, in the case of sickle cell where you know you have to keep getting interrupted and your your schooling gets so interrupted and then your work gets interrupted and then you have to go to the emerge and then yeah and I and I was thinking to myself, well is is there did you see a, a a way and i'm not sure who this should be for probably both of you of having this qi process improve the impact on life <laughs> you know the, there's one thing to to manage the um the acute illness but also the you know working on prevention and also shortening down the the whole time that you end up spending interacting with with the healthcare system, and I, I, I really appreciate that you've that you're working on on part of that process. Do you, do you see uh, the possibilities of of expanding that to to decrease the time in the ED and overall as well? Thank you. Thank you so much for that question, um, Serena. Do you have any initial thoughts? Well, <clears throat> excuse me, I. Um... Yes, I, now that you you you've mentioned basically most of my life is in the healthcare system. Uh you know, yeah, prevention works like when you um because I'll see my uh, my doctors regularly. So prevention really works because I have not you know been uh severely ill in a very long time. Um, only because I have a team of great doctors and healthcare providers and um, like chiropractor, kinesiologists, I have them all. I have my family doctor, I have my hematologist, um, I have my psychiatrist, I have everybody um, backing me up. So, um, you know, the daily, the daily pain is still there. It's just, um, you know, just knowing that I have places that I can go to just in case of anything. If I see something different um, happening, um, if my body, you know, is trying to tell me something and stuff like that, I try to listen as much as possible and, 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 and speak with the doctor and so forth and do my checkups and stay with my medication, comply with all that stuff. So, uh, for me, it's been a little bit easier uh, compared to other people that are living with sickle cell disease because everybody is different. Um, so, yeah, I'm I'm just grateful for my community. You know, I live in Scarborough, so it's like I have the I have the community health center hub, uh, Taibu here, that is just has been so essential in my life for the past couple of years since I moved here. And um, really and truly, I don't know where I would have been if I didn't have that, have them, plus my healthcare uh, providers, uh, you know, separately. Um, but when, it, when I'm going to need time to get them to collaborate, that's the best time to do that, like to, uh, you know, get the providers collaborating because you want everybody to be on the same page about you. And um, so that, that, yeah, uh, so prevention, prevention is the is the big key as well. Serena, I'm so glad um, that you mentioned um, 
taboo. Yeah. Um, and um, I just wanted to acknowledge that um, uh, that uh, the the Black Physicians Association of Ontario and Dr. Anya Norum um, was a big part of me getting involved um, in sickle cell, um, and so was taboo. Um, and um, and so I'm I'm glad that um, that we had the the chance to acknowledge them today as yes. well. Mm-hmm. Same with me with Dr. Anya. <laughs> Kudos to her. <laughs> she just pushed me towards, you know, speaking about advocacy and, and speaking on sickle cell more. So it was it was great. Yes. Um, and just following up um, on that question. Um, I think we recognize that the emergency, you know, great emergency department care um, for sickle cell is is not the end goal, right? Um, so, um, you know, an ideal care um, would um, would involve, you know, avoiding um, severe crises um, that end up um, with people um, needing to to come to the emergency department. We want to give great care when when people do need to come in, but um, we recognize um, that just like Serena has said, there's so much um, that can be done with um, preventive care. There are so many um, supports um, that can to help um, to prevent um, um, these um, some of these complications um, for sickle cell and um, and we've been fortunate to be able to work closely with our hematology colleagues and um, with our internal medicine colleagues um, and to really look at what are some of the other upstream options um, for intervention um, that are possible and I'm, I'm looking forward to um, to seeing what's going to happen with sickle cell um, care over the next five ten years I think things are going to look very different um, than they do today. Great, thank you, Dr. Bryant. Thank you, Serena. I don't think there was one other question, but I think that individual dropped off. So uh, we are a little over time, uh, but I think that we'll, uh, we'll we'll finish up. So just again, thank you to everyone for signing into the webinar today. Thanks again to our guest presenters, Dr. Bryant. Thank you, Serena. This was really, really great. Uh, really helpful to hear and better understand how to pursue this type of initiatives within quality improvement or in a quality improvement framework. Thank you as well to our EDI lead at the CPSO, Dr. Saru Sharda. Um, and again, thanks everyone for attending. This will be recorded. It will be posted on our website for future reference. And uh, with that, thanks again, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.